I was born and grew up in a very uh, warm and very safe environment. My parents were doctors, so it was very, um, having education was like, there was no choice that you cannot have less education. You need to always have at least university level postgraduate. So I did my master's in clinical psychology. I came here after getting married in 2003. He sponsored me. But when I came here, uh, his life was quite a chaos. He did not have the same job. There was no school because he could not finish the school. The first thing that was told to me that, you know, we want a child, you need to start a family right away, no matter what the situation is. So I got pregnant right away from my first child. And then that was another challenge because I, I was in a new country. I was learning a new language. I was settling in a new environment. I was pregnant for my first child. I, I used to sometimes work 10 to 3 and 3 to 11. There was no break in between between two jobs. In 2010 was the first time that I I spoke for myself, you know. I stood up and I said, this is not the way I want to live my life, you know. I am, a, I have all the rights to be who I am and I'm just literally losing my mind. And for that reason, when I told my ex-husband and his family, they were they thought that I was mentally ill. They said, you know, you're, it's just the mental illness that you have. And, and I said, no, it's just not the mental illness. I need to be who I am. I'm just losing my mind. I'm isolated. I don't have any emotional support. I don't have any financial security. And I don't think that's the way I can make it work for the rest of my life. I just spoke for myself, you know. I just got a voice. That was the moment when I got into massive trouble. Starting from 2010, I went through emotional and physical abuse. So in 2011, uh, my ex-husband found a job in uh, Prince Rupert. He told me that, you know, life will be different and then I'll change and I apologize and he turned back to the same beast like he was, you know. It was not physical at that time, but it was more of an emotional trauma for me. He will just literally walk around me and he'll be like, what are you going to do now? Where are you going to go? So now who's going to rescue you? Like, you know, you're still my wife and then you didn't want to be and then you have no choice other than just do what I'm asking you to do. And I felt, oh, now, now what am I going to do? You know? Now who's going to help me? I met this neighbor of mine who was a clinical counselor and uh, I, she connected me with a support worker. August 2nd, 2012, that was the day for me to move out and it was 11 o'clock, my support worker was supposed to pick me up. All of a sudden, I received a phone call and he said, I'm coming home in 10 minutes. I thought I have 10 minutes to save my life. My kids were not even aware of what's going on, but I, I just, I literally ran to the transition house. So I, I made it. I got the full custody of my children and the judge said, you know, there's no point she is supposed to live here. She is allowed to live with her children to where her life is. The first door that opened for me was uh, YWCA Second Stage Housing, which is furnished housing for uh, single mothers. I just started my new life from there. In 2013, I got I got approved for my funding. So, like from WorkBC to get uh, funding to go back to school. That was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I got my permanent housing. Um, in, from YWC, which is a permanent housing for single mothers. And I moved there in April, first week of April 2013. Uh, then uh, after that, I just finished my school recently in December. I think after starting this wonderful life and this amazing new journey through the support that YWCA gave me, now it's my responsibility to give it back to the community and also the positive energy that was given to me, I will pass it on to the people who need it the most. And in order to do that, I'm connected with YWCA Transition House and I will always, always be working for Y so that I can I have this peace of mind that I'm giving back to them what they gave to me, which is an absolute new life and a wonderful beginning of an amazing journey. I was born very sick, very, very sick. Um, but we weren't, they weren't expecting me to read or write or really function normally in society. 
At 17, I moved out from the ages of about 21 till 26. It just spiraled downwards to the point of being homeless, pills, alcohol, cocaine, crack cocaine. It was pretty crazy. At 26, I went to the doctor and he said that I was having a baby. And I had two choices. I could stop using and drinking and try to give this child the best chance or I could continue what I was doing and repeat the cycle that I was born with. So we had the ultrasound and I saw this little, <laughs> this tiny little, little, it's a little ball that just, it beats, it's like a little heart that beats. And I stopped, I stopped smoking cigarettes, I stopped drinking everything, I just stopped everything. I mean, I was having this child that didn't have a choice that I was its mother. I was so scared, so, <laughs> so scared. When Michael, my son, was 22 months, I went to this barbecue and had a couple of beers. My mom, who was in the contract with me, had a responsibility to report if anything like that was happening. She also had a fear that if I was going to go down those roads again, that she would lose me forever. She made the phone call that got him apprehended, and I understand that today now. It saved my life in the end. And that was probably the worst day of my life. <laughs> the one thing that I did right, the one thing that loved me and was I loved so much was now gone. At about four and a half months with my son not being in my custody, I got told that I had to go to residential treatment or I was gonna lose custody completely. While I was at treatment, I got referred to a program, a parenting program, the Nobody's Perfect Parenting Program, which is run through the YWCA. Immediately I felt like I didn't have to be ashamed of what I was doing and what I did and uh, you know that my son wasn't in my custody. And she suggested that I move upstairs. And I said, no, 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 it's not gonna work. I had been phoning all these other places. Nobody was gonna allow me to move in without my son 50% in my custody. That wasn't looking like it was gonna happen anytime soon. So I've picked up the phone and phoned Benita and she booked an appointment in with me. I met Benita and she brought out this <laughs> huge pile of papers. And I mean, when she put it on her desk, the desk, it shook everything. She said that those are all her applications that were in and that she has to go through them. And so I burst into tears. I was just like, okay, here's another bridge that I can't cross, it's, it's not working. And then she took my, my application and put it on top and said that it was her priority and asked me when I could move in. So, in that moment, then I'm, then I'm crying because I'm happy <laughs> and I asked if I could hug her and so two weeks later on April 15th, I moved in to Upstairs, which is the Crabtree Corner housing. There was always a door open to go talk and have somebody listen. I'm six months clean and sober, I'm doing parenting courses, I'm asking for help, it still wasn't good enough. So I was losing hope fast. I was like a sinking ship and I was just like a time bomb waiting to go off because every day it was just new disappointment. And they all just kept me hopeful. They'd all have smiles on their faces and you know, told me that they were proud of me and told me that I was doing the right things. I was 11 months clean and sober and the judge looked at me and said, what I'm looking at here is somebody who has put herself in a safe place and has safe resources and supportive resources. That are, that are willing to stand by her through this process and not give up on her. And he said, we're gonna honor the year clean and sober, so we need to start this process. December 4th, 2012, he was home with me full time. I mean, I had left a 22 month old baby that was learning to talk in diapers and I got home <laughs> a three year old little boy. Well, when I came to Crabtree two years ago, I was a broken, hopeless human being. I felt so alone. 
and then each day that I kept coming back to this organization, it just got better and better. Part of me doesn't think that I would be alive today. Definitely, I don't think that my son would be home with me. Right now I have this little four-year-old boy who 50 times a day tells me that he loves me, tells me that I look pretty, you know, comes up with ideas of fun things for us to do together. It's just, it's, it's like night and day. He's just so gentle and calm and he's a happy little boy who's home with his mummy. Thanks, thanks to this organization.